I'm really excited about this program today. We have two fabulous panelists who are going to present on engagement and really how you can become a place where people want to work. And so we have a short time allotted for this. We have an hour and I want to give all of that time to our two panelists. So I'm going to introduce them and then that I, I ask that you hold your questions or put them in chat. And at the end, I will ask your questions of the panelists. So our first presenter is Shannon Cavanaugh. She's president and CEO of Archbright. And Archbright recruits, develops, and engages talented employees and builds the technical infrastructure necessary to support workplace performance. And they do that with over 2,000 companies throughout the Pacific Northwest. Before that, she was the founder of go-to-market strategies as well. As an executive leader in both product and service organizations for over 30 years, Shannon believes that a company's success depends on workforce performance more than any other factor. And it's driven by an organization's ability to effectively engage their workforce. So she's going to share some information around that with us today. Our second panelist is Diane Toomey. Diane Toomey is the Chief People Officer of PAC Worldwide and a graduate of the Foster School of Business at the University of Washington. Prior to joining PAC, she worked in finance and biotech. PAC is a worldwide manufacturing company that manufactures flexible packaging products at seven US and two international locations and supplies packaging for e-commerce, fulfillment and courier markets. Over the 10 years that Diane has been at PAC, uh, the company has grown from 400 to 1800 people worldwide. And as chief people officer, Diane has a pragmatic approach to HR and she's always looking for ways to keep it simple, get HR processes out of the way and add value to the business by developing and growing the workforce skills and abilities. And I think you'll uh, be intrigued by some of the things that she's been doing. So with that, I'd like to introduce Shannon. Shannon. Thank you very much. I really am, am so happy to be here and talk about a topic that's near and dear to my heart. And obviously the work we do here at ArchSprite. First, let me apologize for my croaky voice. I'm battling a cold, unfortunately, which is my first one in over two years. So um, it kind of caught me by surprise. But um, hopefully you'll be able to understand me. I don't lose my voice through all of this. Um, I just want to kind of open up with a few kind of thoughts and things to think about um, before I turn it over to Diane, who has some great, you know, real life case uh, stories to share. Um, you know, the talent issue in manufacturing has been a critical concern for some time now. So it's not a new, you know, just uh, what to do about attracting and retaining a good talent is, you know, not new. Uh, COVID, the demographic changes in the workplace, social shifts that have occurred um, in the last couple of years, all the things I call it, um, of the last two years, um, have really made this pain for manufacturing, um, you know, just exponentially worse. Um, and it may not be any comfort to you all, but manufacturers are not alone. Every industry uh, we serve at Archbright um, every industry and every industry is finding themselves in some hot water when it comes to talent acquisition and retention right now. They call it the great resignation, the great shuffle, the great shift, the great, great rethink, all kinds of things that are really impacting all of us. Um, and I think, you know, for manufacturers, though, this response to this kind of significant uh, kind of shift in the fault lines um, does though have some unique challenges that we see um, in our membership and um, that that I think it are worth talking about. Um, and it, it really has required all of us, whether we're in manufacturing or not, to really rethink our leadership approaches. Uh, employment, employee engagement, measuring it, um, actively uh, managing it, and um, and having it be kind of the number one initiative from a talent perspective in an organization has been something that we've been 
evangelizing for quite some time now, and it's never been more important. Um, and, you know, many of the things I might touch on here in the next few minutes um, are maybe not what you want to hear about what, you know, you might want to be doing or considering because it'll cost money or it'll be a lot of work or it, it, it feels uncomfortable to you. Um, and unfortunately, I don't, I don't get to come today with any sort of easy, quick silver bullet to, you know, addressing this talent um, issue for you, um, other than, you know, if you focus on employee engagement, everything else falls into place. So some of the things that um, I would talk about that are relevant to where we are today. Um, so, you know, the number one approach that, that we're really having to look at is compensation and benefits. In the past, Archbright would have told you that compensation uh, is a, an, a hygiene issue. You, of course, you have to be competitive, but it isn't what keeps employees engaged in, in, your, in your organization. That has shifted. In many of the engagement surveys that we conduct on behalf of our members, we are seeing that compensation and benefits are amongst the, the top reasons why someone um, might be considering leaving the organization or um, uh, a big part of their consideration for joining an organization. And so we have seen wages, I'm sure all of you have and we have as well um, in, in the work we do, uh, dramatically uh, increasing across the board. Um, uh, and, and we kind of, we call it the Amazon factor because, uh, you know, for example, in our, in our space for an HR admin, you know, Amazon might hire somebody at $25 an hour to be an entry-level HR person, but they're paying them a $27,000 signing bonus with a retention component to it. And that's very, very difficult for organizations um, uh, to compete with. So the competition for talent is fierce and something that, that requires that not only do we have our compensation systems in a competitive place and our benefits and our vacation and PTO time and our policies um, need to be you know, as good or certainly competitive with some of these um, employers that we all compete with. So it's just something that you have to spend more than you usually do time making sure that, um, that you've um, got that um, in place because a lot of what we're seeing is a migration of, of employees who might've considered a manufacturer as an employer moving more toward other industry sectors that either pay better or have better benefits or, or have um, different uh, work environments, which I'll talk about in a second. And then the next one, which is really hard for manufacturers to address is flexibility. The number one thing that um, uh, um, seems to be driving employee engagement in the surveys that we um, run is um, the desire and demand for workers to have more work uh, flexibility. And this comes in a lot of different formats. I mean, work from home is one of them. So where do you work? You know, being able to work remotely. And that is much dif more difficult for the manufacturing sector and to some degree the retail sector. I mean, obviously all of you should be considering what kind of flexibility from remote working you're offering um, in your office staff and in those, any role that can do some or part of their job remotely, finding ways to allow for that. But some positions just simply can't be done remotely. And what do you do in order to offer more flexibility um, in your space? And it may be very unique and independent to your specific type of work. So I can't really give you exactly what you should do for flexibility. But what I can say is that really look at not only where your employees work, but how and when and what kind of um, oversight do you provide? You know, workers may be monitored really closely in the manufacturing environment with few breaks and minimal access to their personal devices and not a lot of flexibility of being able to step out when something comes up and, and address you know, um, outside um, uh, demands that, a, that an employee may have. And that kind of flexibility puts and rigidity to their structure really starts to wear on, on workers and, and has them looking for other opportunities where they have more flexibility um, in terms of break policies or, or any other um, uh, attendance policies that you may have that have been kind of legacy, just how we've always done things and how we've always managed 
um, certain workforces, we really need to challenge ourselves and, and strip out any rules that really are there um, to make managers and leadership feel better about their oversight than perhaps getting the work done. And then diversity, equity, and inclusion, we're seeing that become a very big part of why people join organizations, why they stay there, and how they stay engaged is just how good or authentic of a story does your organization have in, in that space. Um, the workplace environment, you know, we're finding that a lot of workers leave manufacturing altogether just for a better workplace environment. So you may not be able to change the, the, the stinky, loud, uh, 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 you know, circumstances of your particular manufacturing environment. But if you can, you should, and you should always make sure you have safety top of mind. But um, as importantly, are all the other places in the workplace that you're asking um, your team members to participate in, really spending some time, energy, and potentially money to make those more comfortable. And then maybe, maybe you know, in terms of attracting new talent, one of the biggest mistakes we see employers making is their recruiting process still has some legacy things built in that don't allow them to be agile in their hiring. You have to be much more quick. You have to be making moves much, much quicker on your applicants. You don't have as big of a pool and those, those, those candidates have lots of options. So you have to cut out any bureaucracy you have in your hiring system that, that you can, that is not 100% necessary. You know, for example, at Archbright, we used to have three different interview um, rounds for a candidate, including a big panel with a lot of their coworkers to see if it would be a good fit on the team, things like that. We had to start cutting that out because there's just not simply time in the recruiting process uh, to do that anymore. You will lose those candidates. It's just you've got to move to a faster hire and remove all barriers. You know, the number of interviews you do, as I mentioned just now, educational requirements that don't matter to the job. Um, and, and then I would just say really focus on your brand and your marketing of your organization. Focus as much on that towards your candidate pool as you do towards your customer pool or your prospect pool. A lot of organizations spend a lot of time really making sure they've got tight messages and, and a good story to tell for new customers, but they don't spend the same amount of energy and time on the story they tell to new candidates. And then I would just leave you with this, that, you know, improve your welcome wagon. Um, you know, make sure your training and onboarding for new um, hires is rock solid and engage some of your most engaged employees to help you with that process. This is really important when you're hiring um, uh, workers right out of school or from other sectors into your sector because, you know, your, your workplace environment may be intimidating uh, to these employees. And I, we see often people hiring new employees and just kind of dropping them into the system with not a lot of work to get them integrated into the culture of the organization. So you need to have as much work in that in your onboarding process as you might for, um, for uh, on the job training, you know, specific technical skills. And both of those are very important to have really really good and consistent processes for, for all of your new, new people. So you can see all of these things that I've mentioned here are not small things. They are all gonna take a lot of um, skill on leaders' parts. And so I'll leave you finally with how, what are you doing for training for your managers? Because um, a big part of employee engagement and why people stay at an organization or leave is due to their relationship with their managers? Are they treated like a human or another cog in the wheel? So those are just some things to get the juices started in terms of um, what are the, the key things that are popping out in, um, in engagement surveys and what are making the workforce feel more engaged and choose the employer that they work for. I think I'll turn it over to Diane Toomey now to give us some great kind of firsthand um, ideas and tips and thoughts about employee engagement and what it's meant to their organization. Thank you, Shannon. You you actually teed up my um, what I'm going to talk about quite nicely because I think I encompass just about everything that you mentioned. And honestly, this has been a journey for us. Um, it it kind of started back in 2018 when my HR team and I started discussing how challenging it was becoming to find employees to come and work for us. And honestly, this is, <laughs> I was kind of surprised how far back 
that, that started for us um, hasn't changed at all. In fact, it's probably become increasingly more difficult over the last three years. But kind of prior to my joining 10 years ago, our company was smaller. We had about 300 in the U.S. And we only, we only had one U.S. location and management had made a strange decision, but, you know, I might understand it back then, um, to kind of stay under the radar in our communities. And um, they just felt that we were less of a union target that way. But I quickly realized that staying under the radar was kind of working against us in recruiting. Um, we realized we kind of needed to advertise, we needed to be visible and aggressively compete for labor in our communities. So we started to have some internal discussions um, and that, that took place probably about 2019. Um, that led us to the question, why are candidates wanting to work for us? We're just the little guys. We don't have much going on that we can talk about. So how do we become kind of an employer of choice? What makes us special? And we really, we really had some ideas, but we weren't sure we were on target. And we wanted to kind of dig in deeper to that by asking our employees. So we did happen to have a leadership group that was in a training program and we posed that question to them as a project. And we asked them to go find out how PAC can be an employer of choice. So they took that out to our, um, that question out to our employees and explored kind of what our culture looked like to our employees. Um, you know, what made it special, what they liked, what they didn't like. And then we had them report back our findings to our executive group. And one of the reasons I chose to have it come back to the executive group is this is a big project of selling. Um, you kind of have to be able to sell to your executive team why it's even important to have employees engaged. Sometimes it's surprising how they don't make that connection of engaged employees affecting the bottom line. So this was my start of how I began to sell, you know, why we wanted to do this to them. So they reported back their findings um, and they were really surprised to learn at PAC, or that's what we call our company, so excuse me for that, um, that we really had two cultures going on. Um, we had one on the production floor and, you know, there's high turnover there. We have lots of new people coming in, we were growing our culture was continuously diluted on the floor. So they had a very different perception than our more senior, you know, seasoned people in sales, marketing, operations, HR, and engineering. They had a totally different perspective on our culture. Um, and this really bothered my CEO and it, it bothered me too. And, but he decided that he wanted me to fix it. So we've never heard that before, right? Um, well, it's always an interesting mandate. And I know anyone in HR, um, I've heard, I know you've heard this before, we're told to fix or change our culture or engage people. And it, it's hard to know where to start with that. Um, in fact, it's daunting it, and probably we never start it because it is so daunting. But um, when my CEO tells me to do something, I try to follow through on that. So I knew I had a project and, and it kind of became a journey of learning for me. And I quickly realized it was gonna be a lot of teaching as well as selling. I needed to sell how culture can affect the bottom line. So after a lot of research, I kind of landed on a book that really presented a nice roadmap that just made a lot of sense to me. And as Debbie mentioned, I'm very pragmatic. So everything has to be logical to me. And the book just made logical sense. And I'll give you, I, I think we can send this around after the session, but um, I encourage you to read it. It's a quick read. It's called The Employee Experience Advantage, it has a big long title, and it's called How to Win the War for Talent by Giving Employees the Workspace They Want, the Tools They Need, and a Culture They Can Celebrate. And it's, it's by, he calls himself a futurist. His name is Jacob Morgan. He has a podcast. He has followers on on LinkedIn, he, he's kind of interesting. He kind of stays ahead of where the workplace is going. Now I will, I will admit the book is kind of based or geared towards um, technology companies. It talks a lot about technology companies in it, but I thought the logic's all there, the baseline's all there. It just makes sense that I could adapt it to manufacturing. 
So the book is kind of based on a concept of employee experience. Um, so he um, makes a good point that culture doesn't include a lot of things. Um, so he has three different environments that he asks you to consider that make up every single employee experience at an organization. And these involve the physical space that employees work within, the technology that they interact with, and then the culture. So those three things became what we wanted to really understand in our company. So we wanted to ask what experience they were having in those three areas and then design their work life around that feedback. So it's kind of, this is an ongoing process. We started, this is our fourth year of, um, excuse me, our third full year of going through our series of questions that we ask. Um, and we actually branded this work-life experience and we called it the Pack Life. We gave it a logo. We um, put it on our website as something that, it, you know, potential employees would be interested in. We did some videos, we have some text around it. We wanted people to understand this is why we might be different because we really do care about an employee's work-life experience every day. So, and then in addition to that, we formed kind of a cross-functional committee that was made up of a bunch of different areas in our company. And we called it the Pack Life Lab. Periodically, I move people in and out of it so I get fresh voices. And they kind of became the, um, the work body of the, the next step, which is a set of questions that we came up with. They, we have 17 of them that we ask around the physical, the technology and the culture. And we use those every year. And how we got the feedback, cause you know, manufacturing, it's a little bit difficult to even just conduct a survey, right? We had a lot of skeptical people in our organization filling out a piece of paper. They just think we're going to, you know, we know who did it and they're it's just, they, they have kind of a skeptical approach to all that. So we decided we could use these kiosks and I'm pretty sure you've seen them at some point. They, I've seen them in bathrooms at SeaTac even, but they have four or five little smiley faces on them. And all, all we do is put a question up on that kiosk and they tap a, a red, green, yellow, blue, whatever, or I guess it's red to yellow or green um, face that tells us how happy they are about that particular question. So it couldn't be more simple. It couldn't be more, it was really quick. We just put them around our organizations where you know they clock in or take a break. Um, and we asked one question a week and um, because we have you know different shifts and we had to capture everyone. And it's, it, it's not as expensive as you think. So it was a pretty, um, it seemed like it was high tech but it's really quite low tech. <laughs> but we were able to, um, I get a lot of responses that way. It wasn't, there was no barriers to responding. We probably got, you know, some people probably tapped two or three times on one question, but um, I don't think that hindered our data. So um, I, if you want to look into that as a company called Happy or Not, they, um, I'd be happy to also take questions offline about that experience and that company. But anyway, it worked for us. They also have a link that you can grab and use on your web pages if you have intranets and our remote workforce could get to those questions in the same fashion. They just tap a smiley face. So it was nice that we got feedback in real time. We could post it back out to the employees just the following week. We would put the feedback right there on the kiosk so they could see what question was asked last week, what the responses were. And each week we had our plants kind of go over some of the written feedback because they could also type in written feedback and that, that gets real interesting. Um, I always enjoyed the written feedback quite a bit. Um, and then some things were, you know, easy to address quite quickly. And it kind of, you look like a hero just addressing things, you know, real quickly. Some of them were just like, we want ketchup and mustard packets in the, you know, lunchroom. Well, you know, bam, that's done. So it, it, we got a lot of traction quickly with some of the simple things. Um, some of the things were going to take more time, obviously. So we at the end of our questions, we had a lot of data. 
Um, for us on our in our lab, it was fairly easy to see what it was telling us. But this was our first time out the gate, and we didn't really know if we should trust the data. Um, and we needed to make sure that we kind of get a good baseline because this was going to be something that we're actually going to do every year. So we brought in, and this, this part got a little more expensive and it may or may not need to be done if you want to go this route in your organizations, but we brought in a focus group. And that allowed us to kind of dig in deeper to how people were answering the questions because, you know, you answer a broad question, five different people will think of it five different ways. So we just wanted to make sure that we really were understanding how they were answering and why they were answering it in a certain way. And it also validated our accuracy of our data and it also validated our process. And I think our employees enjoyed having an outside resource come in and talk to them. So it made the whole thing seem like it was, we really you know, wanted to know what they were thinking. And, and honestly, we did. I don't, I don't mean to sound glib about that. We really do wanna know. And from our feedback, we, we were able to kind of find some things that we would work on for that year. We tried to figure, I mean, there's all, all kinds of stuff comes up, but we wanted to really work on things that moved the needle the most for us. So our lab kind of started planning on how things, um, what, what things we would work on and what we, how we would tackle that. And in our first year, just for example, our list ended up being, obviously this is always on our list, but it was nice to have it validated with data that we need to give our supervisors more tools and training. So we were able to, you know, kind of dig into that and we were able to put together training programs that we thought would be helpful um, for them that year. And then they wanted better ways to communicate with each other and, with, and to get communication. And I'll talk a little bit about what we did on that. The other thing they wanted was, as um, Shannon mentioned, that they wanted more to more workplace flexibility. Everyone wants more workplace flexibility, right? So as she mentioned, it's quite a challenge for us in manufacturing. And I'll talk a little bit about what we did. We're actually still working on that one. That's a toughie. Um, but each year we roll out these same questions in the same manner, because we're kind of looking to create a ritual, something to expect, and they know that they're going to get, you know, heard. And we try to always be talking to them, but it, you know how that goes. If nothing else happens, at least we know we're going to hear from them for three months with our one question um, per week. And that became that ritual. I think it's really important to our culture. It just shows us, you know, it's all branded and we're out there. We're talking about pack life. Um, and then each year we bring the data back into the lab and discuss what we want to hold on to and what we want to get better at. So some of the things that we've done and that came out of the lab, and as I mentioned before, we've been doing this now for three years. Um, they wanted a communications application that, and, and we built one, we purchased one that is mobile. So everyone's on their phones, right? No one really goes to a bulletin board or we had these digi boards in the lunchroom, but people weren't even going into those during COVID. So we really needed something that would, meet them where they're at. And that was, we realized their phone because they never let loose of that. Um, it kind of works like a Facebook. We can do texting, you know, to employees. We can put up postings, we can put documents. It's all at the fingertips. Um, and we've had pretty good traction with that. I'd say about 65% of our workforce is on that. Um, it's hard to convince some people that they should be doing that, but um, I'm, I think we'll get better than 65 as, as we, we've only been at this now for about eight months. But as people kind of hear that that's where information is going, I think we, we get a little more traction. And every new person that comes in, we make them download the app while they're in their onboarding. Um, we decided that we wanted to um, create the ability with our time and attendance system for people to be able to offer up shifts or swap shifts really easily without having to go to their supervisor and figure all that out. That, my friends, was a nightmare to put in place. Um, we thought it would be fairly easy with, we use ADP for our, our um, time and attendance. We had to switch our platform for time and attendance and ADP. We're still working on that. That's been a three-year project. 
Um, we're almost at the end of it and we should be able to kind of get to the point where we can have employees swap shifts and it should be fairly easy. Um, it, you know, it's hard to offer up much more flexibility than that, unless we just want to create a hundred different schedules and try to keep track of that. But I don't think we can efficiently run our business doing that. Um, we, as I mentioned, we develop some leadership training modules for supervisors. Um, we keep expanding and improving on that. It kind of got a little sidetracked during COVID because we, the delivery system wasn't, um, platformed into a virtual state. We were still doing it kind of teacher classroom style. So we have got it platformed now. We did that actually in-house recently. So the um, resources there were not tremendous, um, just time and you know we don't always have that either. But I, th I think it's gonna force us to find um, or force us to get in, you know train the trainer kind of format in our plants so that we can just again kind of get that ritualized into our organization as part of onboarding um some simple things we did everyone complained about our vending machines we just upgraded everyone to a marketplace system they love it um we one of the things that came up quite every year was that they never got recognized or rewarded enough um, and, and sometimes that's just a simple thank you. And that always seems like, gosh, why can't you, the supervisors just walk around and thank everyone for showing up for work today, but they don't, um, they get busy. So we decided that maybe we need to make it kind of gamify it, make it more fun. We rolled out kind of a recognition, re recognition and reward platform where they earn points that they can purchase gift cards or go on Amazon and get things. And it's actually the participation on that, we've only been doing that now for three months, but the participation has been tremendous. And I go on there and I can see all the back and forth of people that are recognizing people. And um, we put our star performer out there on that and service awards. So it, it, we were just struggling under the weight of our, our size to get that all taken care of consistently. So it's a lot more consistent for us. And I think the employees think it's kind of fun. And we will integrate that into our communication platform. Right now, it kind of is a standalone, which isn't ideal, but we're getting there. Um, another simple thing we did was they didn't like a couple of our holidays, so we moved those around and you know let them know that that was due to their feedback that we were changing these. They complained about benefit enrollment being paper based and complicated. We put that all online and made that easier for them. Uh, they complained about the 401k platform was clunky and not easy to access. So this year we made a move to a more user-friendly and self-service platform. So there's no more paper. So, and, and the other part of this is the, we were able to slice and dice this data. We, we took the data as a whole company and then each location, each group of people in each area of each location could get to their data. So they could figure out if there was maybe one, you know, like maybe the warehouse wasn't really happy. They could actually dive into that um, and find out what's going on there. So it was nice to have the ability to slice and dice that and then take that back into the plants at a more local level and fine tune it. Yeah, one of the simple things we found out was they didn't feel safe in one of our locations because we didn't have a PA system. Well. Okay, that, that costs money to put in place, but not that much. And if they weren't feeling safe, that is something that, you know, we weren't meeting their needs or their expectations in the physical space. So that's, you know, how we would apply that is just like, that's part of them coming to work every day and feeling safe. So in, in you know, what we, we, were, we came to the conclusion that what the data gives us is interesting and we should, definitely not overlook the things that we are doing well and that we want to hold on to. You tend to want to focus on all the things that need to be taken care of or people aren't happy about, but then you might overlook all the things that are the reason they have come to work before we started all this work. So it, it, that's something that we constantly have to remind ourselves is don't get sidetracked by, you know, this. Remember that this is our core and this is what people have liked 
So some of the things we found out people liked were events and team building activities. They like clean workspaces. They like to feel safe. They like supporting our mission and could relate to it. Um, surprisingly enough, they like the technology we've been providing them. Um, and these are just as important to understand as all the other things, because like I mentioned, when someone in the boardroom suggests like a way that they might want to save money, um, that you may, that involves, it might involve changing something that's really important to our employees. And they may think it's just a line item on a, you know, spreadsheet, but you make a really different decision knowing your employees, knowing that that's really important to them. So what can look good on paper can really affect how in the employee experience um, is to our employees in a way that really negates any potential savings. So just really knowing your employees is so important before you do any of this work around engagement because you could be headed in the wrong direction. Um, so it's really a different way of looking at your organizations and making decisions. I think the biggest thing is how we make decisions now. It really has changed how we make decisions. Um, and that engages employees and helps with the bottom line. And I'm really a believer. You have to keep listening and keep adjusting. And this work never ends. <laughs> it never ends. And you keep having to sell the, in the substantial impact that you make between engagement and happy employees and revenue. That's, that's a HR job. So um, I, I guess I'm ready to open it up to questions. So uh, Diane, one of the things that you said that I think correlates with what Shannon said is the fact that you, you know, you created a vehicle for people to give you feedback without risk. You know, you, the way you framed it was they complained about this, they complained about that. But really, you know, the, the, a lot of those things are the rigidity, right? Shannon talked about the rigidity in manufacturing and you said you didn't have a lot of flexibility, but by having them be able to complain about the ketchup packets or the vending machines or feeling safe. Those were all important things and part of their work experience. So uh, that came Sometimes up. Sometimes it's a little stuff. <laughs> yeah, I think it is. And listening. And you made it easy for them to communicate with you. If somebody, you've done so many wonderful things. If someone wanted to start, I think the book is a great uh, place and has some really good ideas. And I like the fact that it's really simple. And we've posted that in the chat for people who are listening. What, what do you think brought the biggest bang for the buck and where would you start if you maybe were a smaller organization or had to do it again, because you've been working through it. If you were starting all over and doing it right now, where would you start? Well, I think you have to find some way to be able to hear from your employees and, and make that feel important to them that they're being heard. So not only do you have to listen, but you have to have some actions around what you've learned. So it's a really, it's a very transparent process. And honestly, it's a little scary to get started on that because you just don't know what you're gonna hear. And sometimes you feel like you can't, whatever they tell you, maybe something like Shannon had mentioned, and then I know this is gonna come up next year because we just finished our questions for this year, but wages and benefits and compensation, that's all gonna be in the picture next year because there's so many pressures on our employees right now around inflation and costs of goods. So you need to hear it, but we can't always be able, we can't always be in a place where we can react to it, you know, and make everyone happy all the time. So you kind of have to lay out what this employee experience is. It's kind of a, a intersection of what they need and what the company can provide and find that happy little middle place where it's a win-win for everyone. And it's not going to be everything they ask for. So you have to be realistic about it going into it before you ask the questions. And that's, like I said, I was, it felt like I was doing a lot of teaching and some of that teaching was, you know, the expectation piece, what to expect out of this process from the employees and, and from our company. So and before yeah, we embarked on it, we knew we might have to spend a little money on things, but we knew that we, it was an investment. We weren't just spending money. I was going to ask you about that. Did you set the expectation for the employees? We want to hear 
what you need and we may not be able to address everything so that yep yep that became can... part of our communication about what we're doing but we we went out and talked about you know we branded the the pack life experience and then talked about what it was and we defined it very clearly with we call it uh, the three components were care, connect, and create, and those tied back to the physical and the technology and the culture. So we had we had some um, actions around that as well. Shannon is nodding and um, agreeing with you in the background, and I wonder if you had something to add, Shannon. No, I'm just yes, 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 all of that. You know, <laughs> um, being as transparent as possible about what you can and cannot do, and just um, keeping conversations open um, is uh, super important in this work because if you ask for feedback and then you don't do something, it's it's almost worse than at, not having asked in the first place. So um, if you can't do something based on the feedback, just having an open conversation about that. You yeah. know, that came up for me when you said ritual too, Diane, because oftentimes people get really excited. Okay, we're going to do engagement but they don't follow through. And that's the worst thing that you can do with your employees because they, you set the expectation that you're going to be listening and you listen for a short time, but you don't follow through with action or you don't continue that process. So yeah. it takes some discipline around that, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, an, it's a process I call infinity. It just keeps going on and you never, I mean, people's needs change too. Like, Shannon mentioned next, I, I really do expect that next year the needs will be around compensation and benefits and we'll get a big focus on that. Um, but unless you're asking those questions, you're not going to keep up. You're not going to know what they're needing. And, you know, you have different generations in the workforce and slowly, you know, we're going to have more younger people and less, you know, older people and their needs are really different. So you have to kind of be able to find what everyone's needing to make their work-life experience the best it can be. I do have a couple of questions. And if you do have questions, please put them in chat. One, and this is for both Shannon and Diane, and that is, do, uh, and Shannon, you, you work with a number of companies and Pat can answer this in context for them, but do companies have a waiting period before holidays are paid for their workers or vacation? And um, how much vacation do most manufacturers offer? Is it, you know, in today's environment, do either of you have a recommendation for best practice? So that's really about three questions. So if you, if you want me to repeat them, we can go one by one. But yeah. that I think what's, what the, the basis of the question is, what are other people doing and what are other people offering and how can I be competitive in this market? Yeah, so... Um, and that's a loaded question, of course. Um, Archway does do a benefit survey every year of our membership. And so there's a lot of benchmarks in there that would help you answer that question specifically that I don't have off the top of my head. Um, but what I would say is that um, be as generous as you can afford to be um, in, in all of those things. Um, so I'll take the first question about uh, waiting period for being able to take holiday uh, pay or I think that was the question. Yeah, I understood it. I mean, I, I I would take as much waiting period away as you possibly can, and it's scary for leaders to do that. I mean, our first right two years ago took uh, went away from accruals for even vacation. So you started our right, whatever your vacation amount is, you have automatic access to it. And that there's some policies in place to make sure somebody can't you know come in quit the next day and get a, a payout of all of that there's there's process to protect that but we took away this idea that you had to accrue you know one hour per or you know one one day per amount of hours or whatever the accrual process was prior to that and just took that away and just said you know here's the bucket of time off that you get you're going to get it in your bank immediately and work with your managers to plan your time off um, you know, so uh, we took away waiting periods for 401k contributions. This used to be, you had to be here for six months before we contributed to your 401k. That's gone. We contributed the very next um, month of your employment. So just wherever, you, you know, wherever you can kind of break down those kind of legacy, um, 
uh, policies that you had in place is going to make you look more attractive and 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 show better appreciation to your employees in terms of the competitive market. Hope that Diane, a bit. What about PAC? How did you hand how do you handle vacation and holidays with your uh, plant workforce? You mean you want specifics of what we do? Oh well, given do you do you have a long waiting period? Do you as much as you want to share? Oh, oh okay, that's fine. No. Yeah, we do have a, a 60, uh, 60 day. Yeah, 60 day waiting period for taking time off and getting benefits. From um, holidays, they can use right away. Okay. okay. And that's just because we have such high turnover in the first two or three months of someone's, you know, onboarding that it just doesn't make sense to give them benefits ahead of them, knowing that they might stay a little longer. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Another question has come up. If it, if anyone has more questions around those things, please put them in the chat. Another question that came up is, when selling to executives, is there a measure or measures that you decided to use to demonstrate the value? How did you get their buy-in? Um, I am fortunate that I work for a CEO that understands the, um, and not just says it, but understands and believes in the value of a, an engaged employee. Um, so for me, it might've been a little easier for some of you. I, it's hard to say, it depends on the skepticism you might have in your leadership teams. Um, there's quite a bit of data in the book about how um, employees that are engaged and having a good work-life experience can increase the bottom line. And there's a lot of data on that online as well. I, Harvard Business Review, I think had some good data. Um, it, there's a lot out there. And I used some of that and they were just like, oh yeah, we get it. So I, I had it a little easy um, on an ongoing basis. Measuring it is not ever easy. Um, you can kind of look at, we started just trying to look at turnover, but in this day and age, I don't know that that's really an effective measurement at all. Um, it, people just come and go from jobs. I, I don't know that it's anything that we can change too much at a certain level um, and a certain kind of job. Like it's kind of like working at McDonald's no one does it for the rest of their life, right? Um, but we also, from year to year, we're looking at trends on our um, questions. So on our feedback questions, we either it's up from last year, it's down. So that kind of becomes a measure for us on how effective the work we're doing has been. Okay. ROI is always a toughie, um, but I think we all know logically it makes sense, right? Because you don't want something, I mean, we always talk about that person that comes to work, but doesn't really, it's not really engaged. They're like kind of retired on the job. We know those workers aren't productive for us and we're not getting the, the greatest value out of that. So logically, I think we all know it makes sense that someone who's engaged and wants to be there and enjoys what they do, they're just going to be more productive. And that is that employee that we're looking for. Okay, um, I have another question. We have relatively green managers. Where would you suggest we start with training? Are there any online programs you've used and liked? So I'll, I'll present that to Diane and then I'll let Shannon follow up with that because I think she's local and has some options for people too. Yeah, we, um, we used a company for just some general modules to get them going. Um, you know, just how do you, how do you hire? How do you interview? What can you say? What can't you say around all that kind of stuff? Um, we have a whole platform of those. I wouldn't say that's very effective, but it does help someone get started. Um, we designed our own training because I wanted to involve our particular values in, into the training. Um, so that it was kind of common language. So I don't really have any, sorry. Okay, Shannon? Yeah, so um, 
couple of options that Archbite has for you, and they can be conducted with what we call virtually. So um, they are live training. There's a live instructor, instructor but um, uh, you can do them virtually uh, like we're doing today, or you can send them to a, a, a in-person class at our facility, or you can hire a trainer to come out to your facility and hire multiple managers at a time. But for green, for green managers, uh, we have uh, a couple different um, options. One, we have lead worker, um, a lead worker training class, and that's for the person who's leading the work of others, but not necessarily their direct manager or supervisor. And then we have supervisory skills or management fundamentals, and it kind of depends on the environment, if it's a supervisor in a manufacturing setting or if it's a manager in a professional um, office setting, a different type of setting. Um, it's essentially the same type of content, just catered a little bit case study wise, et cetera, to the audience. And it's a three day uh, training. So it's pretty intensive um, to just bring a uh, new managers who've never done it before up to speed, not just on the compliance things, like what you can and cannot say from a legal perspective, which is definitely one of our sweet spots, but also just how do you give feedback um, what are some of the things that you need to be doing as a, as a supervisor or a manager uh, to be a more effective, you know, communication skills and there's role playing in that training. And that's why we really believe that live training for new managers is uh, better than um, online or, or um, pre-can training, although we, we highly subscribe that too and offer that in our Mazo platform for those who, who really like that type of training. But for new managers, they really need that kind of hands-on live training, we believe. Thanks, Shannon. We have a few more questions. So I want to make sure we get them in. Uh, Diane, do you measure employee referrals? And is that, a, do you, in your opinion, is that a good place to work? It, no, let me reframe that. Do you measure employee referrals? If this is a good place to work, it seems logical that employees would help with your recruitment. How does that work for you? Yeah, that's actually one of our 17 questions we do ask is, would you refer an employee to come work here? So that is feedback we get. It's interesting, we re recently just ran through data for five years on our all our referrals that we've gotten from employees and realized it is not a good source of, of employees for us. For whatever reason, they don't stay long, and we end up paying out a bonus for that. Um, and we decided it was quite an invaluable program for us. Now, that doesn't mean that it's not a good measure or or question to ask someone. But we, the value for us, it was for the money that we paid out was not there. Thank you. Another question that someone uh, wanted to ask you is: You talked about the company changing from flying under the radar to competing for the potential workforce. Uh, what do you think did you, or what, oh, what things did you do uh, that you would recommend? In other words, to, when you came yeah. out from under the radar. <laughs> yeah. Well, we did it slowly, but we started um, involving ourselves into the community. We go into high schools and do a few presentations. We worked with um, a local community college on some students that came in and did some case studies. Um, we started going to job fairs. Uh, we advertised on some billboards. So we just kind of started getting the word out in many different ways that we would had been afraid to do before. You know, it's funny. So we made our website a lot more splashy. <laughs> I was coaching someone who works for you, who is a senior leader now, and he started as an operator at the company. And he was telling me his story this morning. And he said he saw your uh, flyer on the side of your building. That's how he found you. Yeah, we did that too. Shannon, do you have some recommendations on that? No, I think I think those are good. I think you know, um, it. it we often do suggest, um, you know, recruitment referral kind of bonus spot bonuses to help, you know, jazz up the the um, the uh, effort, um, you know, util utilizing your employees and uh, to, for referrals, um, which is like I think the first part of that question. I think is a really good 
idea. They're your best evangelists and making sure that they're posting on Glassdoor if they haven't already, to what their real and authentic experience is because every candidate coming in your door has looked at your, at your Glassdoor. Um, um. I, have, I have another question, which I think is a question and a solution tied in together, but it says many companies do exit interviews. Does your company conduct welcome interviews to see why someone accepted your offer as well as, um, you know, how other companies figure out, you know, ask people why they're leaving instead ask, why are you coming? Which I, I had not thought of. Do either of you do that or? Yeah. I mean, we have onboarding meetings um, with every team member and I meet every new team member that comes to Archbright. And one of my first things is, is why did you come here? You know, what about, what about us, the process? How was the process? Um, you know, I like to make sure that that recruiting process I mentioned earlier, you know, uh, was what they experienced and just learn more about what, you know, what motivated them to accept the position at Archbright. I think it's, you'll, you'll learn some really great things. Diane, we'll end with you. Do you do those welcome interviews or ask those questions? We, we do. We do it um, definitely for our salary level hires. I think we're a little hit and miss on our hourly hires. I know, you know, we, we do three or four days of onboarding with them. And occasionally if I see a group in a plant and I, that they're onboarding, I stick my head in and ask each one of them why they, why they came to work for PAC. But I'm not sure that we do it on a consistent basis, but we do get good information from our salaried um, interviews. Thank you. Uh Diane, for sharing your experience in employee engagement. I think you presented a lot of really interesting information. The book is a great starting place for people. And Shannon, your points about being competitive in the market to be able to attract people, I think both of you have really given some quality information. We appreciate your time today.